Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 12, 2020. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight. Congratulations for finding the show. For some reason, it seems to be a mystery, but we're working on that, and I think it's gotten better as of late. If you're watching uh, the recording on YouTube, I want to thank you, and I appreciate you taking time out of busy schedule to do that, too. What are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them relative or somewhat relative to the slides, just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And hold off on your stock picks until we get a live charts and just ask about one ticker at a time. I think everybody knows the ground rules here, but um, anyway, that's all for your benefit, just so I don't get sidetracked too much. So what are we talking about? Well, these are the ones that we've been waiting for coming out of a drawdown. I want to focus a little bit about on a little bit about how the fact that trading could be a little bit streaky. And as I've said a thousand times, I've been criticized in the past for saying that, making it sound too elusive. But if you've been here for a while, I think you know it can be kind of elusive. And sometimes it just takes one really good trade to come out of the drawdown. I was looking for, I got locked out of my account for some reason, but uh, the Google passwords expired. I don't know what happened. But somebody had wrote recently in Facebook, they were in a drawdown until one stock, and that was CRSR. We'll talk about that one in just one second, too. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often, sub it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So, a while back, I talked about drawdowns, and I'm going to recap a little bit of that. And what I'd recommend you do if you haven't seen it yet, go back in and watch that presentation. Not the most exciting presentation in the world, but probably one of the more necessary presentations out there. And it's something I'm gonna revisit over time, especially when we're in drawdowns. And it comes with the territory, but flat out, I'll, flat out, I'll tell you flat out, it sucks. And, and I've known some very incredible professional traders over my career, even just kind of listening to people I don't know personally, talk about some of these things and realize that it could be a very dark place when you're in a drawdown. But there are things you could do in order to recover and continue on. Now, just to kind of recap here, there was a post, one thing that sort of has me thinking about this is when you guys reposted a, a, a tweet, I think it might've been John Z in the Facebook group, on somebody that was going through some dark times as a trader. And I think they were a relatively new trader, if memory serves. And then I started responding to it. And before you knew it, I was a page or two into my response, just because I think it's such an important concept. And being a newer trader, I think this person probably had the initial success. As I often say, it's interesting. I'm gonna mention Peter Brandt here in one second. And I was looking at some of his videos on YouTube, but one in particular where he was talking about drawdowns, and one of the things he said is one of the worst things could happen to a trader is they have initial success. And that's something I would preach about over and over again. I, I told the story a thousand times, but years ago I sold a boat and I didn't get such a great deal on the sale. You never get such a good deal on a sale. But uh, I figured it wasn't worth throwing the dinghy in. So I sold the dinghy separately and I think I made $1,200 on a dinghy or a thousand bucks, something like that. And I told my wife, hey, let's run down to the casino and take $200 of this money and parlay it turn it to a thousand and to my surprise she jumped up and said yeah let's do it you know so we went down to casino and we did really well we shot some craps and, and i always forget whether we were up 800 or a thousand but i know we went home with at least a thousand dollars in our pocket after dinner and everything else we did while there and about halfway home i told her i said this is the most expensive trip ever she goes what do you mean you made money i said no you'll probably be back or you want to go back and that could that's one of the bad things in trading, not to make a gambling analogy, which is always not a good thing, but if you have initial success, when, when you start getting your, your butt handed to you is when it gets pretty ugly. And recently, somebody wanted to join a Facebook group and I said, well, you gotta be a gold member, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, I just made 20 times my money on this option position. And I'm like, well, if you can do that rinse and repeat, then hell no, you don't mean it. He's like, why do I need you? And I'm like, well, if you could do that on every trade, rinse and repeat, then you certainly don't need me. But to put it mildly, that poor bastard's not gonna know what hits him 
when he does hit a drawdown, I'd be willing to bet by now he's probably hit a few bum trades since. Now, just to recap a few things when you need a drawdown, and some of this came from the Facebook post, and a lot of this came from that last presentation that I did. But the first thing you have to ask yourself is what's changed in your trading? I was listening to uh, the, what's the new Market Wizards book, the uh, Unknown Market Wizards, and, and Peter Brandt's the first chapter in there, and that's why I'm kind of talking a little bit about Peter Brandt tonight. And I was listening to that while I was working on my slides. I know, my, uh, what do you call it? Uh, multiprocessing is a bad thing because we only think linearly, but since it was on the topic tonight, I figured it'd be okay to, to watch that. But he talked a lot about a lot of the things like I just said about the initial success is worth the worst that could happen to you. And he also talked about how he started changing his methodology and started doing all kinds of different things, just trying anything. And that's human nature, just to keep trying something different. So you got to be careful. You got to ask yourself, what's changed in your trading? Early this year, I was chasing a lot of rabbits, as one of my clients pointed out when we talked about all the positions that we both were trading, and I was trading a lot more than he was when all that um, go when all the go-go stocks were really going based on the Robinhood people. And I realized I was I started I was doing incredibly well, and then I started going to a drawdown, and that was the first trading that had to go. I had to come back to my core methodology. So first thing you need to ask yourself is what's changed in your trading? Are you taking more risk than you used to? Or are you day trading when you should be position trading? Or are you straying from your core methodology? The next thing you have to ask yourself is what's changed in the markets? And the client I was just talking about, he's a pretty good scalper. At least he has been this year. He started scalping and he's doing incredibly well. And then he started to blow up a little bit. Fortunately, he he stopped trading, and I almost took a bet with him that he'd start trading again. But I know I knew I could kind of goad him into trading a, a little bit, like, "Hey, check this out." And he sees it moving. I know he would take off, but he actually took he did a few commitment device things, like changing his password and uh, having his secretary change his password or whatever. But he told me right before he quit trading when he didn't want to quit trading, when he was trying to make back what he drew down, even though he was still he still doubled his account, a little bit smaller account, but doubled it nonetheless. It's still a pretty decent feat. And as he was drawing down, he said, but it was working so well. And those are that with it's different this time and a few other words, little phrases like that, have been the ruin of many people. Huh? Well, it, well, it worked, didn't it? It was another one of those things, especially when you have bad behavior. And in his case, being a scalper, we had HVs. I don't remember exactly how high they were. I think they were in the 70s. And then now they're back to the teens. So it's like that HV absolutely imploded. The volatility, if you're not familiar with HV, historical volatility. And I have the formula for TradeStation. I have the formula for Metastock. I have the formula for, the formula is actually built into ACP. And then I think it's also built in to Metastock. Metastock has my indicators. So what's changed in the markets? And I, I can't identify specifically what's changed in the markets relative to him, but I'd be willing to bet the fact that that volatility dropped about 80% or 90% from where it was probably had a big part of why the scalping has gotten a little harder. Now here's a biggie. What's changed in you? Are things okay at home? I mean, 2020 has been a crazy year. Quarantine, no quarantine. Uh, it's just been nuts. You don't need me to tell you that. But what's changed in you? Are you feeling good? Are you healthy? I mean, I had, well, I'll give you, I'll give you an example that seems kind of minor. My wife sprained her ankle really, really bad. Well, she's used to exercising and she was kind of frustrated that she couldn't exercise. And then that frustration, we get kind of frustrated together, whatever. That all comes into your trading. My, I had a, a knee, I injured my knee when I was a kid. I don't know how, but anyway, I had surgery on it a long time ago. And every now and then, it just acts up on me. And if you go back one or two weeks of charts, ago, I think maybe last week, I was really in a lot of pain trying to stand here and present. Well, that was kind of wearing on me in my trading. And I had to separate that life from my trading life. And as I often say, your life is going to spill over to your trading, and your trading will spill over to your life. And it can be a bit of a negative downward cycle. When I was going through a drawdown a while back, and I was a little bit more active than I should have been, a little bit hyperactive, my wife used to come home 
we'd have lunch and she'd visit or whatever. And she told me at some point, she said, uh, I said, I hadn't seen you in a few days. What's going on? She goes, I don't come home anymore. She's, you know, because you're in such a mood. And I just was crazy busy with the volatility and everything. So the trading was beginning to spill over to my life. And that's one thing that I recognized. And I knew that I had to remedy. So as I've said a thousand times and going and watch those presentations, if you can't sleep at night, what's changed in you and your trading is a spillover to your life and your life is a spillover into your trading. And it can create a negative feedback loop. And you gotta be careful with that. Now, I'm doing a little reading on neurology. Oh, I have been for a long, long time. Ever since I saw Denise Scholl in San Francisco, she was talking about neurology and how you can't separate emotions from decisions. I know you've heard me say that a hundred times or a thousand times probably. And that sort of prompted me to go down this, this uh, I wouldn't say rabbit hole, but go down this, this quest to learn a little bit more about neurology. And that was really a big epiphany for me. We all have, whether you know it or not, we all have a bit of a shared psychology when it comes to trading. And I've learned this through answering hundreds of thousands of emails, and I forget how many they are. I, my wrists are hurting right now. I've ruined my, through all this repetitive uh, things and answering all these emails over the years, I've already had one surgery on my elbow and I've got issues. But long story endless, I see, and especially now that I've got the Facebook group, and instead of answering 20 emails, I could go in and answer one question and then 100 people, or however many people get to see it, and that saves me a lot of energy going to that one-to-many model, which is a little bit more efficient than the one-on-one -on -one model. Anyway, in going on that neurology study, I'm going to give you a few books to take a look at in just one minute. But especially what I've been reading lately about dopamine and all, it's not the drawdown so much, but it's your fear of the future. It's your fear that the drawdown will continue forever. It's your fear that you're going to blow up your account. So getting back to the what's changed in you and what's changed in your trading, are you deviating from your core methodology? And the, the presentation I was watching on Peter Brand earlier, he talked about how you have to get back to what you normally do and then you also have to get back to the basics and and lately and i'm going to show you a few of these positions in just a minute that have helped me climb out of this drawdown are very 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 simple concepts i think most of what i do is pretty simple every now and then i get go off on a little bit of a rabbit hole but i think for the most part i really come back to the basics on a lot of this stuff and that'll make a lot of sense in just one second now, along those lines, and this is where you have to really look within yourself, but along those lines, there's a fine line between digging your hole deeper and taking that next trade or next trades, that next one trade that's going to be the one big winner or the next several trades that are, that are going to get you out of the hole and digging yourself deeper into the hole because you might not be of the right mindset that fear that fear of the future with these dopamine type of chemicals might stop you from focusing on the here and now which is a different set of chemicals altogether or hormones if you prefer <laughs> you know you make a hormone you don't care einstein once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And this is where you really need to ask yourself, are you trading your core methodology? It doesn't have to be what I trade. In fact, you should probably trade in your own particular manner. But if you can learn what I'm doing, and if what I'm doing makes a lot of sense, and you're willing to embrace that you're going to have losses and drawdowns, and maybe several in a row, maybe five in a row are going to be stinkers at some point in time. And what's worse than that is the length of the drawdown. A lot of people focus on the depth of the drawdown, but what's even worse is the length. And that's something that Peter Brandt reminded me of earlier when I was listening to 
or watching, listening to his uh, interview or watching the YouTube video. So that's where you have to really think, am I an example of Einstein's definition of insanity by taking that trade? And this is where you come back to the, the must take trade or the missed take trade. And I, I felt the thought come to my head a few times. I said I wasn't gonna say it because I say it so many times, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Sukota once talked about intuition versus intuition, and that's gonna be your enemy when it comes to coming out of a drawdown because your confidence is knocked down so low, it's pretty hard to take that next trade. I have to admit on some of the trades I'm gonna show you in just one second, it was almost like a close my eyes and push the button type of thing because I didn't want another loss. And we'll go through these quickly because we've talked about them before, but it must take trade, the stock is trending or worse and then ideally accelerating in trend which we'll get to i think in a few minutes a mistake trade is choppy or worst trending lower you're trying to make something happen that just isn't there the must take trade trades cleanly it persists in a trend it tends to go up day after day the mistake is it trades like electrocardiogram you can almost hear that beep 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 when you're looking at it the must the must take trade is accelerating in trend. The mistake trade is decelerating in trend. What I would encourage you to do is, again, if you can't sleep at night, and borrowing a line from Greg Morris, it, you know, just don't operate heavy machinery after viewing. But go in and look at, especially some of the older weekend charts where people didn't really know me that well and how I trade, and look at some of the stocks that people asked about. Sometimes week after week after week and they weren't trending or trading and that's because people sometimes try to try to make something happen when there's nothing really there there's human nature there there's even a neurology there i don't want to get too far into that rabbit hole on that but there's a lot going on that causes you to take mediocre trades and i guess to sum it up basically in your current or prior career you're paid to take action. And sometimes that taking of action could make the situation worse. As uh, Dr. J, a psychiatrist who's also a client said, you have to take whatever train wreck comes along, otherwise you would starve to death, right? It's kind of like, <laughs> my favorite, I got a little old man's mechanic, he's, he's the best guy in the world. He's about half the price of anyone else. I love him to death. And uh, he's helped us nurse along a few cars for the kids. And on one, in one, in, we uh, sold the car at his place. And he was nice enough to, to um, do the transaction with it for us. Long story endless, he said his, uh, his, his brother-in-law had an old beat up car and he kept that thing alive for years and he was sick of working on it. And he did the same thing. He left the car there to do the transaction. And the guy got in the car, drove it out of the parking lot and pulled it to the other side of the parking lot and threw the mechanic the keys. Asked them to fix it. Anyway, so you want to see acceleration in the trend and not deceleration in the trend. A lot of times people, because I say, look at the net net price change. Okay, hey, it was at uh, 20 and now it's at 30. Yeah, but it was it was at 40 and it's kind of rolling over. So that's where you got to really pay attention to that. You have Landry light that's positive, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. Use your favorite moving average. This year I've kind of fallen in love. I know you probably want to party with me with the 30-day exponential moving average. A mistake trade would have little or even negative Landry light. And when we get to the live charts, I'll point out some of that. The mistake trade is an obvious setup. When I'm flipping through the charts, it kind of reminds me of Malcolm Gladwell's Blink. It's another one of those books that you probably should read. And I see something that it, it just kind of jumps out at me, okay? And I'm going through a couple thousand charts every night. And if I see that one, it jumps out at me. I'm like, okay, that's it. That's the stock. But let me just go through everything else to make sure there's nothing else out there. It should be blatantly obvious. And if you're looking at something for more than, say, a minute, but more than a few seconds, and you can't decide whether or not it's a good setup, it's probably not a good setup. Now, a lot of times I will spend more than a minute or two looking at something because I, I, if I'm going to publish my research, as I do every night in the trading service, I want to make darn sure that I really, really, really like the setup. But 99 out of 100 or 999 
times out of a thousand, that setup jumps right out at me and I'll know within the first few minutes of my research, usually within 10 minutes of my research every night, I, I've got my setups. And then I spend another two hours dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure there's nothing else out there that's better. The net net should be significant based on the volatility of the stock. Sometimes the stock is only up a point or two over a long period of time, and it looks like it's this big old nice gradual trend. It has to be significant based on the volatility of the stock. An IPO going up five or six points or a biotech going up five or six points might not be that big of a deal. Let's say it's in more of an established trend. Let's just forget about IPOs for a second, like, like an IPO or something like that. That might not be that big of a deal, but if it's a utility or something like that, of course, volatility and everything went crazy this year. REITs went crazy earlier in the year, and they're pretty uh, they're pretty high in volatility now too. Anyway, the net net price change. Where is it now? Where was it? And that should be pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised at how many people ask me about stocks. Again, go in and look at those old wicked charts if you get really bored, and just see how many people ask me about stocks that have gone absolutely nowhere for six weeks and sometimes much much longer. Recreational trading, big mistake. I often quote the code. It's interesting that Peter Brandt quoted him too, or it might have been Schwager quoting him. And the point is that having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine on your desk. The coder doesn't have a quote machine on his desk. And today I watched it all day and I was tempted many, 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 many times to go over there and I try to keep my trading station far enough away so I don't just sit here in front of my desk and it's a stand it's a fixed standing desk to where I physically have to get up and go stand in front of it. That's that's one of my commitment devices, not that it stops me from over trading. But I have to physically stand up, physically walk over there, and then that just gives me a, a little while to think about what I might be doing. There's even a neurology involved in all that. Now, we've talked about this quite a bit, so I'm gonna just kind of go through it really quickly. If you take a trade, the first thing you need to do is a pre-mortem. And that's just as important or more important than the post-mortem. And that pre-mortem is where you look at the trade and you time travel into the future. And if it's a good looking trade, and you say, this thing looks fantastic. I have to take this trade. I must take this trade. And if it stops me out, because I know that sometimes it happens, spell the silent SH, I'm willing to live with that and willing to shout next. Now, as I often preach, the market is a bad teacher. So if you take a bad trade and it has a positive outcome, you have learned nothing from the process. So good trade, a must take trade, positive outcome, pat yourself on the back. Don't let your ego go to your head, okay? And then say, all right, the game now is to find the next one of those. If it has a negative outcome, as Douglas once said, treat it like a good salesman. A good salesman has a couple of rejections on a phone call, on his sales calls, he goes get a cup of coffee, and he knows that he's got a few bad calls out the way, he gets a cup of coffee, composes himself, and he starts banging out some more calls because he knows he's getting closer, 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 closer to that win. Whereas a bad salesman, two or three bad sales calls, he goes drinking his lunch. So the mistake trade, again, there's that intuition, I knew I had somewhere in here, you aren't really thinking about your future self. And that's the hard part is thinking about your future self. And I'm going to get more and more into that over time when we get more and more into the neurology. And I'll give you a book on that in just a few minutes. But the problem with the mistake trade is if you have a negative outcome and recognize that you were stupid, then the next trade is going to be 
a great trade, a can't stand it trade, okay? It's gonna be a must stay trade. But if you feel like you were unlucky, then you're likely to have not, obviously not learned anything. And then the worst thing can happen is you make money on that bad trade and you say, I am a market guy. And that gets you into a lot of trouble. And you end up in that negative feedback loop that I have illustrated on the bottom. Now, there's a little neurology at work and a lot of psychology at work when you go into a drawdown. And here's some books I'd recommend you read. The Brain by Gary Wink. My copy is dog-eared and tattered and underlined, and I've been meaning to outline it, but it seems to be lost in this messy office of mine, <laughs> so I need to get a hold of this office. But I would recommend you read it. Not all of it is going to apply to trading, but certain parts will. The good news is you're going to learn so much about your brain from this book that I think you're going to find it very exciting. I know you want to party with me, but uh, as I said in my stock chart show earlier this week, when I read this book, every time I'd read a little bit, I'd tell my wife something about the brain and she, and she would suffer fool gladly. And she's like, where did you learn that? The brain book? You know, let me guess, the brain book. And I'm like, yeah. But it's really, it's really a good read. It's really entertaining. And once I find a copy, I'll, I'll get some quotes in, from it and, and put it in here. By the way, if you go to Books to Read, I'll put the link up in the edited version of this. All of these books should be there. And the ones that aren't there, I'll put them in tomorrow, Friday, the 13th of November. Market Mind Games, as I said earlier this week, there were some criticisms on this book on Amazon, but I think it's very much worth reading. As I said earlier, I met Denise Shaw in San Francisco. We were both speaking at a conference. And it's a good book. I, I only I actually long for more with the book, though. I wish that I wish like someone like I know that sounds kind of stupid, but as I said earlier this week, someone like Malcolm Gladwell could have like fleshed out some of her stories a little bit more. But that aside, I think it's I think it's a really good book, and I think it's something that's really worth reading. So I would encourage you to do that. Here's one I just started that's really good. The Molecule of More. Of more. This, I think, is going to really help us out because it focuses a lot on dopamine, but it also talks about what they call the here and now hormones. And the dopamine plays a big part in your trading. And it reminds me of the two U's we talked about, which is, I think, Brett Steenbarger. In fact, I know it's Brett Steenbarger. And the, the part of you during your analysis that gets excited is where your dopamine is charged up. And then there's a different part of your brain that's involved with the actual management of, a tr of the trade. I knew a husband and wife couple at one point in time, and I didn't think about it at the time when they tell me this, but the husband puts on the trades and then the wife has to manage them because that's what she, that's her forte. But it's like her job is 10 times harder than his job. He's kind of in the wild enthusiasm phase, okay? He's, he's the one you going into the trade all excited and she has to deal with the actual markets, which is the here and the now, or the H and N, as they talk about in this book. But anyway, I'm just kind of scratching the surface on the molecule of more. I have a lot more to say about that, but I would recommend you read that one. And another one that I'd recommend you read that I just, while I was looking for the Wank book, I found this one. That does that doesn't sound uh, that sounds a little off color, doesn't it? The Wank book. It's uh, the investor's brain. The Power of Mind Over Money. This is pretty good too. And you'll get a lot out of this one. And I'll have more to say about these four plus some other stuff on neurology. But I think the numerology is probably overlooked a little bit or a lot in trading. And I think that's a, a big part. And if we all have the shared neurology, you might argue that we don't have the same psychology, but we do for the most part, okay? But wrapping your head around the way your brain works, I've already kind of, wrap my head around this dopamine thing a little bit over the last couple of days. I just started this book like two days ago, this molecule more, but it's already kind of helped me in a couple situations recognize how the, the kind of the, to manage it, so to speak. And I thought that was pretty cool. But anyway, the inside the investor's brain is pretty good. 
and I have a lot more to say about these, but uh, we just kind of scratched the surface. The good news with the neurology is you don't have to get into the the, the weeds of the neuroscience, just a cursory understanding about how it all works. And a lot of those aforementioned books are really along those lines in, in layman's terms. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a neurosurgeon or a neurologist to understand all these things. There's Peter Brandt, my new friend. When he was in a drawdown, he said, if I'm going down, I'm going down with what I know how to do. So he was at a pretty serious drawdown. It looked like he was on his way to ruin. And then he eliminated all that extraneous trading that he wasn't normally doing, the normally accustomed to doing. And he just went back to his roots and he went back to his core methodology. And that's what got him out. And that's pretty much the same exact thing that I did. It's weird. I could sit here and tell you all these things not to do, but you have to. It seems like we all have to go through that same sort of journey ourselves. It kind of, it's a slippery slope. Slope. Things kind of go south really quick. I was reminded of that yesterday. I, I was in a situation yesterday with things, not trading wise. It was outside of trading, but things went really south really fast, and I had to maintain composure. And it almost got ugly, <laughs> or it did get ugly. But that's a story. That's a two drink minimum on that story. I'll be happy to tell you guys if uh, we ever we meet up. Yeah, I saw that book. I was looking at. Uh, I was looking for the the. Uh, I was looking for a, a screenshot of this book because I first thing I do usually with a book is I take the cover off, throw it away, which I've regretted on some of the books that have become rare books in my collection. It doesn't matter. I dog ear them and write all over them anyway. But I did see that one, The Psychology of Money, Morgan House. Yeah, I'll be, I'll, uh, I'll take a look at that one. If you wouldn't mind, could you just cut and paste that to the Facebook group so I'll see you tomorrow? So let's talk about drawdown recovery. Now, never say never, but my goal is in any trade that I show you here to have mentioned it already either in the Facebook group, or in some cases, I may have picked up the trade from the Facebook group, but it was mentioned publicly before I talk about how the trade worked. And as you know, the ones that I'm gonna work fairly well, but I've shown quite a few stinkers too. Usually with the stinkers, there's not as much lesson other than you gotta honor your stop. And, and that's a very small lesson. The management of the trade in general is a little bit more complex. But the reason I'm showing you these tonight is these are some really good trades that came along recently, and they really helped me personally to get out of the drawdown. And one of them in particular is helping to get the service out of the drawdown. And I'll show you that one in just one second. So anyway, this was a few days ago, PLTR, B at B, that's buy at B. Now buy at B, we're looking to get long at some point past the, uh, yeah, John, I'd be happy to do that. And I'll also put the, uh, I'll put the link to my website page where the books are, and I'll also add those books in tomorrow morning, first thing. So buy at B, we're looking to buy the first closing high after the five days of trading. It could also be on the close of the fifth day, okay? Now we've covered this, last week we talked a lot about IPOs. So I wanna show you some of these examples, follow up on them from last week and how they're actually helping out. These are the ones, so to speak, that we've been waiting for. Who said that once? We are the ones that we have been waiting for. <laughs> okay. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. I thought that was kind of silly. So the buy at B, the only caveat is, well, there's a few caveats, not enough time to get into all the caveats tonight. But one of them is that the new closing high has to be above the day one high if the high is set for the week. So if Monday the stock comes public, the earliest we could buy it would be Friday's close. And if the high was set for the week, like in this case here, even though Friday's close, which I just noticed earlier tonight or when I was putting these slides together, even though Friday's close in this particular case is a new closing high, it is not greater than the high, the day one high, which was the high for the week. Now, if that high on day two was higher than day one, okay, that would not be the new high for the week. 
So you don't longer have to worry about it closing above that high. If that doesn't make sense, go in and watch last week's The Week in Charge. So following up on this one, so it just sort of trading sideways and meandering. Now the buy at D is something to get you in really, really early in IPO, but the great thing about this particular example is sometimes it takes a little while. And I think they had earnings tonight, and I think so far they survived. So here it's a new closing high, but it's below the high of the week, which was set on day one, the day one high. So it's the greater of the new closing high or the day one high. It's probably an easier way of saying that. In this case, day one high is greater. So there's no trade there. It continues to trade kind of sideways. And then it begins to take off. So it closes at a brand new high. Now, this is a, the closest thing to a this is the closest thing to a breakout strategy that I'll trade because it is a little bit of a breakout strategy. Breakout strategies are, are known to fail. There's a lot of reasons why. One is everybody has a computer in their desk. Another reason is the the, the programmed trading, what do they call it now, the flash trading or whatever. They're looking for these breakout patterns and they're fading them. They're probably creating them and fading them. What do I mean that by that? They're probably forcing that breakout. They know where those breakout points are. They're trying to make them happen and come back in. And IPOs, volume's a little thinner. They can't go in and out a million times a minute or maybe more. So a lot of those fun and games don't happen in IPOs, at least early in the process in these somewhat thinner IPOs. Anyway, buy market on close. The next day I was blessed with a nice little profit, or I should say we were, because I think some other of my Facebook peeps here tonight took it. If you took the trade, let me know. So I just like to capture a representative sample. And in this case, about a thousand shares per 100K is a good round number because we don't wanna lose more than 2% on the trade. And a two point stop is probably plenty on this particular one. So two points is good enough, and that's what we're looking for on the profit target. And then it's sort of worked its way higher since, uh, today notwithstanding, I think. So if you take those two points you made in the first loaf, we're looking for a thousand bucks or one percent overall, that's a thousand dollars. And then the second loaf, we're still long the trade. So on the mark to market, again, it's not gonna look as good today, but on the mark to market coming into today, when I put the slide together, we were up 21.45. And I can say we now because I see a few of you guys took it. So you add those two numbers together, that's about 3% per 100K. And that's that's not bad for a trade and it's still open. So let's see what happens with this one. But that helps to get you, obviously, out of a drawdown. Now, it's interesting. I forget who said it. I don't know if it's John Ross. I want to say it's John Ross in the group. We had, I talked about drawdowns, and he said, I was in a drawdown until CRSR. So just this one trade was enough to get him out of it. So his drawdown must have not has been as bad as mine. Imagine that, a guru talking that he loses money sometimes. huh? How about that? So this was the original setup. It was a first deep retracement, FDR. Those are the parameters there. And you can see that this stock traded nicely higher, just kind of took off right out the gates. And, you know, I'm just kind of looking at this for the first time. Why did I not trade this one? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. You buy a B would have been on this day here. You know, some of these, sometimes I go in and look at them, and I forget that I actually traded the buy a B. Did anybody catch a buy a B on this? And then it pulls back, and in that pullback, it has a bit of a TKO type of move, which is pretty cool, trend knockout. It continues to pull back. Now, it's it doesn't look like it, but that's a fairly deep pullback, given the volatility of this stock, so far at least, from 22 down to almost 17. So that's five points, and off the top of my head, it's about, what, 30% pullback? That's, pretty, that's significant enough. And in IPOs, I'm a little bit more lenient. It's kind of a... I guess 
if you don't want to call it a first deeper trades, but just call it a pullback or just call it a TKO. 2001. Okay, yeah. So you were one of the BIB players, David was. Cool. So all this preaching does not fall on deaf ears. That's you may have a night. Thank you. So it gapped higher, but it didn't gap like extremely higher. It didn't gap that much above the entry. So it was an actual setup. And then it began to rally over the next couple of days. And then we were able to sell half at the initial profit target. Now, this was a core trading service recommendation. So Stuart also bought the buy B. I need to go in and look and see if I bought two because I probably should have if I didn't. And I need to figure out why I didn't if I didn't. So there's the transaction down there. I think it was 666 shares. In this particular case, in this one account, I just bought 600 shares for whatever reason, but close enough for government work. And after selling half of those shares, you can see it kind of meandered a little bit, it corrected. It's kind of painful to watch that open drawdown happen. And I know I'm kind of last week at band camp with you with, with Peter Brandt, but I really enjoyed his interview with the, the Market Wizards and uh, book. But he was saying that he doesn't look at his open portfolio, he only looks at the closed trades. And I, I look at every tick much more than I have to, but I will tell you this, when I, I, start, when I started coming out of the drawdown, I stopped looking at my overall equity. Now I did still look at the open trades daily because I use that kind of my gauge as to wait, do I need to be taking profits or do I need to be cutting my losses? And maybe I need to find a better way of doing that. Maybe some of the things I preach. On the service stock, it's really easy because it's spreadsheet already set up and I just follow the plan. And my own trades, a lot of times I don't have everything mapped out. But anyway, Peter Brandt doesn't look at the open profits until that trade is closed down, that it's no longer open profit. And I think, and that's something that I've just kind of, I wish I did, didn't, um, it's something that I probably want to flesh out in future shows. And I might reach a point where I just stop looking at the equity. And there's a lot of days when I'm putting that equity into the spreadsheet, which I think I'll have a copy of in a minute. I'll show you from last night. And there's a lot of times I'm like, this is kind of meaningless, okay? It went up a little, went down a little. Yeah, we had a good day, but we're going to have bad days. It's kind of like, but I like to show the methodology in action and what's happening on a day-by-day -day basis. So I don't know. I think I might reach a point where I stop looking at the equity. I mean, I come in at midnight and look at my equity, <laughs> you know? So I think there's kind of a happy medium there. Anyway, we sold half, as you can see, and then that was about uh what was that three points actually four points is where i was where i got on this one got a little bit more than that thousand dollars and then on the second loaf on a mark to market basis at 29 14 300 shares that's 2488 so you add those two numbers up that's 3636 so that's another 3.6% coming out of that hole. ELGM is another one I played, and you can see this is a thread. I just grabbed it out of Facebook. And I have to thank Mike for bringing it up. And I I, I, I saw it in my analysis, but I, I might have forgotten about it had he not bring it up, brought it up in the Facebook group. So I want to thank him for that. And that's that's where it helps to have a second set of eyes, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth, and I appreciate you guys for doing that. So you can see that on day four, this particular stock took out the day one high, so the day one rule no longer applies. All we need is a new closing high. And what happened was I anticipated that closing high, as I said last week, and I went through the details of why I did it and how I did it, but I ended up getting in a little bit early on this one. But luckily it did pay off and I was able to take off half the profits. And so there's the trades there. And then it's still open. 
kind of had an ugly day, as you can see. And I think I, did I stop out of this one? I'll have to check. I may have stopped out of this one. I did, okay, okay. I did stop out. So yeah, there it is right there, stopped out. And so this is, isn't the most stellar example in the world, but I made a little bit on it. I think it ended up being 800 bucks and change. And then I stopped out. Now, if you annualize all that out, I made a little bit on the second loaf too, as you can see. So another 126. So overall, 936, about 1%, almost 1% on the trade based on the account size. But it's better than the poke in the eye. And if you, I was doing fun with math and my, my wife's always say, what's that thing you do? It's annualized, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, you make $100 in one day, that's $25,000 a year. You lose $100 in one day, that's $25,000 a year. And sometimes I'll sweep $400 loss with recreational trading for lack of a better name. And, you know, I just have to remind myself, that's $100,000 a year if you did that every day. If you make a four hundred, if you make four hundred dollars a day, that's a hundred grand a year. So sometimes it's good to annualize these things, but you can't look look at them as permanent income hypothesis if you are making that money. But anyway, annualize that thousand dollars in less than a week is obviously. I think I did the math earlier. It comes out to like a sixty thousand dollar trade, sixty thousand dollar increase if you did that on every trade and. The, and that would be pretty good. And obviously there's compounding and all, but that's that's kind of fun with math, but there is some validity to that. And I think where I'm going with it is just be thankful if you make $1,000 in less than a week on one trade, especially if it's about 1% of your account, that's a good week, okay? Just on that one trade. Now, one thing that I started talking about in my stock charts show, which is a little bit more structured and especially you know, time-wise and topic-wise, et cetera, than this show, where I could be a little more free-form, we can go back and forth a little more. But that was recorded anyway. This one's the only live show that I'm doing at the moment. But one thing I was thinking about is simply, you know, the name of the show is Trading Simplified, which I have a trademark on. And how can I simplify trading? And, I, and I've been thinking a lot about you know getting back to my roots, getting back to the basics. and and that's why you're seeing a lot of these more simple patterns because that's what I'm actually trading now and not trying to venture too far into those rabbit holes of all these other stuff. And I thought about going back with Trading Simplified and just kind of rewinding everything back to the beginning and doing these very simple, simple things. And then I'm like, well, how can I simplify trading into a word? And that word was acceptance. And I'm going to do a series on that or continue the series, I should say. And I think trading all boils down to accepting a lot of things and being willing to embrace and live with them. And every methodology is going to have its own nuances. And if you're a reverse to the mean trader, you can do really good for a while, then you're going to blow up. Almost invariably, you will. I get more, by the way, as I often say, I get more pure reversion to the mean type of traders who come to me and become my clients, even some that have actually worked with other reversion to the mean traders as programmers and such, who come to me as clients than any other methodology or yeah, any other methodology combined. Anyway, so especially with trend following, because I know the nuances there and there's a lot of tough things when it comes to trend following. I know I make a lot more money if I was a YouTube guru to tell you that it was it was easy and you're just stupid because you can't make as much money as me because I'm the only one that has the answer, you know, and, and it's not like that. We all go through all these good times and bad times. Can you explain what reversion to the mean means? Yes. Think of the mean. Mean means average, right? When a stock pulls away from the average or any other kind of market, whatever market you're trading, and it gets very extended, you short that market because it's due to revert back to the mean. That happens quite often, okay? It happens enough for you to get kind of sucked into that kind of trading, but that'll work until it don't. It's, it's a bit of a trend, foul, trend fighting type of methodology. Now, I've known successful traders who do it, but they have very, very strict 
money management. The pure reversion to the mean, that's why I used the word pure earlier, they don't use stops because if it stretched this far, then it's going to reverse if it stretches this far or this far or this far, okay? And again, that'll work until it, until it don't. And I have some bad experience here, two drink minimum on some of those type of things. Now, the aforementioned trader that was actually successful trading reversions to the mean, at least he was 15 years ago when I gave a speech to his group, who did use the money management in his reversions to the mean trading. So to help from blowing up, he said, well, you're a reversion to the mean trader. I'm like, no, I'm not. It's like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, I know you are, but what am I? And finally, he's like, he explained to me, your pullback that rubber band is getting stretched down. He says, the only thing you're doing differently is you're trading it in the direction of the trend. So you've got a nice, nice trend, and then you've got that TKO move or whatever other move, pulling that rubber band back, okay? And then you're looking to catch that snap back in the direction of the trend, hopefully get that swing trade out. So he got me, guilty as charged. Now, anyway, getting back to the accept things, it's just a couple of these I wanted to cover that I talked about earlier in the other show. As a trend follower, you will spend a lot of your time less wealthy. Again, I'm not doing a good job selling you on all my stuff and trend following, right? Well, the only way to make money in the market is to capture a trend. You have to sell higher than you buy. I know, big duh of that, right? <laughs> but a lot of people fight trends. I'm not sure why. Actually, I am sure why, because they're looking for things that don't exist. They're taking whatever setup comes along. They're trying to make something happen. They're recreational trading, et cetera. All these things we talked about already. Anyway, in Fortune's Formula, which is a, a pretty good read, it's on the Kelly Formula, which if you trade the Kelly Formula, you're either going to parlay your account really well or you're going to blow it up because you take on way too much risk with that Kelly Formula. That's what Larry Williams used to make a million dollars out of $10,000 trading index futures when he did a trading contest 30, 40 years ago, whenever it was. And not to get off on a tangent, imagine that. <laughs> but I heard him speak once and he said that he made a million dollars that year, but at one point during a year, he was up to $2 million. So that $1 million was a 50% drawdown. And the way he puts it, he says, he tells everyone that's the year, if you ask him, that's the year he made a million dollars. If you ask his wife, she says that's the year that he lost a million dollars. And anyway, the reason I'm thinking Larry is he used the Kelly formula, and I, I didn't hear him say he actually used it himself, but the other Larry, Larry McMillan, if memory serves, told me that that's how he did it, by using the Kelly formula, and we talked a little bit about that. He probably went to party with it too. <laughs> actually, Larry McMillan, he's, he's, he's fun to party with. So anyway, this might be the best example. Well, actually it is because it went back in the red today, okay? But here's a stock that we shorted a while back and the blue's the entry, the green's the initial profit target and the red line above is a stop. So it triggers and what happens? Well, it immediately goes right back up. So the first week or so of trading, we're in the red. We have one day in the green, feeling pretty good. And then we're back in the red, okay? For a long, long time. So we're green and then we're green enough to where we began to lower our stop down a little bit. All of a sudden it looks like this might just work out, right? Nope, what happens begins to rally up. I know, I think it's Stewart or Stewart, are you in here? Did you, Stewart said he stopped out of this one, even though I know the stop didn't actually get hit. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to follow up on this and see what happens. As I often say, micromanagement will work until it don't. Now, if you have a different way of trading my setups, uh, oh, you did stop out. Okay, Stuart, did you, were you following the methodology as it was laid out? Did you get frustrated with the setup, the, the, the position? Because it's been frustrating, I know. Or did you, do you trade things like in a little tighter manner? Okay. Because I know some people, and Lawrence, you stopped out too, okay? A couple of people stopped out. Stewart said he lowered his stop too early. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I don't want to put salt in anyone's wounds, but micromanagement will work until it's until it don't. And most of the time, David stopped out too. Boy, we got a bunch of guys in here stopped out. Okay, interesting. So, okay, no salt to be poured in wounds, but 
in this particular case, and you know, of course, I'm hoping it turns into a winner longer term, so we can make a case for not micromanaging and the fact that you spend a lot of your time less wealthy. When you are trading on the short side, especially it seems you will spend a lot of time less wealthy. Unfortunately, this one went back into the to the red again. So you know, maybe you guys were right in getting out early, but let's just see how it shakes out. I learned a long time ago. In fact, I have to, I have to relearn this lesson every now and then. I'm not holier than now. The, the Beaky trade, I thought I would make it through a presentation without bitching about that. <laughs> but the Beaky trade was, I, I got out about 30 points ago, and maybe not quite as much now, but a few days ago, it was about 30 points higher. So that's that's $3,000 on 100 shares, okay? So that's a significant amount of money that I'd micromanage myself out of. But you wanna see that anguish? Go in and watch the setup of the um, presentation from a while back. Symbol on that one is BEKE. So if we look at this, now this snapshot's a couple days old, but it was 32 days, so now I guess it'd be 34 days. But 32 days in the trade, only eight out of those 30 was the trade actually profitable from the entry. So 75% of the time you were underwater. And if you take those eight profitable days, on half of those days, if you look to the right here, okay, you could see that on half of those days, the next day it actually ended higher. So you're giving up those open profits. Okay, David says we were not right. What would one what's one point on hundred shares? Yeah, okay. Well, like in my case with the Beaky thing, it was a, it was a, it was a point forty three, so I had one hundred and forty three dollars per hundred shares, and I said I don't feel like giving up another point forty three. I'm going to draw down. I need to get out of this drawdown. So, so lesson learned. Here's my negative psychology and neurology, I guess too. Fear, okay. Fear is a is a dopamine type of reaction that I'm going to give up another. $143 per 100 shares on this thing, screw it. I'd, I'd rather put money in my account. Well, that's not how you put money in your account. You put money in your account by willing to, when necessary, allow that capital to stay in harm's way. Not Don't throw caution to the wind, but if you're not stopped out, you're not stopped out. And that much additional risk is not gonna kill you, okay? But missing that $3,000 move per 100 shares can make a significant impact on your account. That's because we do things in like a round 100K account with $3,000, that's what, 3% move, and that's significant. I thought it would be cool to go in and grab a market and program a little indicator. And the indicator is simply plus one if the market is making a new 52 week high, okay, new closing high, and minus one if it's not, okay. And I was somewhat inspired, or I should say probably completely inspired by what Greg Morris once said. Greg Morris once said that markets only make new highs about 4% of the time. So I grabbed this particular market, and you could see. If you added all those little green lines up, it's probably only about 4% of the time it was making new highs. So you would look at this and say, okay, do you think that this period of time, and I'll let you know how long it is, it's 10 years, okay? So do you think this market was higher or lower based on all of the red in here, okay? Well, it was higher. In fact, it's the S&P 500 basis of spiders going back about 10 years. Not that I would recommend you buy and hold or buy and hope as I call it. But if you bought and held through all this, these, this backing and filling drawdowns or whatever you want to call it, all this red, you would be up 211%. So I just thought it was kind of cool the way it shook out when I did this little experiment here. So let that be a lesson in trend following. Obviously, you want to use money management. You want to stop out. You don't want to ride out these long extended red periods. This is probably the bear market of, uh, I'd probably guess, 2000, okay? This is probably 2007, maybe. 
okay? But as you can see, even though the market was significantly higher and there were many bull markets in here, very little of the time is the market actually making new highs. And go back and look at like CRSR. It'd be fun to do this. I know you want to party with me, right? <laughs> Some of you guys have party with me. I'm not that boring, right? I see a few of you in here tonight. Um, but it'd be interesting to go in and, and look at like some of these big winners, and that's something that I tend to do eventually on some of these. So a lot of your time is spent less wealthy. Now, we did the show on drawdowns a while back, and the closed trades came to, plus the open trades, I think, came to like minus 62, actually the closed trades came to minus 62.50. The open portfolio as of last night doesn't look quite as good today, but we got to stop at some point and do the show, right? So now we went from a $6,000 drawdown to a $75 drawdown, okay? And that's because the open portfolio looks okay. It looks pretty good. We got a couple of decent winners in here and we've climbed out of this hole fairly nicely now what what do most people do once they're down this much they quit okay and as i often say it's it's kind of like an african queen it's like they were trying to get to they were trying to get to the lake because of the germans or whatever and they went through bugs and insects i guess a bug is an insect leeches and all these other things and being shot at to try to get to the lake and then they just give up and then the camera pans out and they're just 50 yards from the lake that they were trying to get to. They gave up right before the drawdown ended, right before they were going to make it. So I know it's not easy. And believe me, I go through the same feelings that everyone else does. And if anyone tells you they don't go through all these feelings, they're lying. And this is a kind of a reincurred conversation. It, it came up first in, in, in St. Lucia. And one guy was saying, you ever notice the traders at the bar that are good traders are always like, man, I didn't, I kind of got whacked or I could have made more money and they kind of beat themselves up. It reminds me of Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets. Also read that one when you get a chance. It's also in books, books to read. I actually downloaded her new book today. So I'm work on that one too soon. Anyway, she talked about the good poker players versus the bad poker players. Well, substitute trader for poker player, it's the same thing. The good ones go to the bar and like, in the, even if they won a tournament, you thought you, they might have lost. Like, oh, I could have played this hand better. Why did I do this? Could have done this better. They always are thinking of what they could have done better. The bad traders are always bragging like they might have gotten, they either gotten lucky or they're lying, <laughs> you know. The one thing you have to accept is that the market often rewards bad behavior. So we got stopped out of this one a while back. We did hit the initial profit target, made a little money on the trade. And I have a walkthrough on this one somewhere. And then this stock took off and it rallied over 100%. I think it's since pulled back again. It's kind of volatile, as you can see. And I kind of watched in anguish as this stock took off without me. And I get a phone call last week. Hey, Dave, I'm up a hundred and something percent in this lack trade. And then he also rattled off several other trades he was up a hundred percent or more in that I had already stopped out. And that worked nicely for him, but that's another one of those things that'll work until it don't. It just so happens that these go-go stocks after shaking everybody out, took off and went straight back up. So be super careful if you're busting the plan and not following the rules, okay? Okay, thank you, Lauren. Lauren's gonna post that book into the uh, group. Yeah, I'll put, I'll put links to all this stuff. Donald through the trade and PLTR, good, awesome. Okay. Stopped out. Okay, Dave, I buy a stock 
at a trigger and two minutes later, I am negative. Always the norm. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes, and this is something I'm trying to wrap my head around. I think it was uh, Livermore once said his best trades never gave him a minute of worry. And I'm always trying to figure out a way to just stay in those best trades and get out of some of these thinkers, but I think in modern times, especially, you just have to be patient, and it seems like, it always seems like a lot of times these trades go against you. These IPOs, which have been on fire lately, knock on wood, and I'm not thinking about this permanent income hypothesis, believe me, and that's one thing that, once again, Mr. Peter Brandt, one, one, last week at Bandcamp, it's all fresh in my head, but he talked about the fact that you can't see the market as an annuity, okay? Because it's not. And anyone who says you can make this much money or a consistent amount of money every month, every month, every month, quit your job, is is delusional. And the reason they're selling you that is because they can't do that, but they could sell you on that fact. Or they're doing something like a um, reverse of the mean trading. David S. Drinking a Beauty Hazy IPO. Oh my goodness. Modern Times from San Diego. Ugh. You're killing me. I, I stopped the, I stopped drinking during the week. <laughs> it's like COVID kind of messed that up a little bit. Oh, just stay home and drink a little bit. Oh man, I'm gonna wait until uh, I'm gonna wait until tomorrow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off. But yeah, oh, you're killing me. <laughs> it's a reality. I am complaining. Reinforces your point. You almost go. Yeah, you know that's the thing. It's like so. David is saying like. He's watching every tick, I'm guessing, and he's watching that stock go against him, and it's frustrating to see it go against you. And that's like that. That it's funny. The hardest trades to take, some of the hardest trades trades to take, that take a leap of faith, like to buy a B. It's like sometimes you're immediately, immediately at a loss. Ghost of the machine. Okay, where are you? Ghost is a local beer. They make ghost. Not far from here, right up the road, I think. Yeah, ghost on tap. Oof. Oh, you're in Texas. Okay. Yeah, that ghost is dangerous. <laughs> it's like 8% or something. And the Yave, or however you say it, E-N-V-I-E, I should know it because I'm French, is uh, is is only supposed to be like 5 or 6, but it's it's much stronger. I used to have a brewery in the garage, 20 gallon system, but I've, uh, when we downsize, I got rid of that. I'm kind of missing it though, I am. All right, uh, as you know, if you've been trading for more than a day, trading sometimes can be a lonely sport. I think we're made to be together. I think we're made to interact with each other. And that's why I started the Facebook group. So I would encourage you to join and everybody here is in the group, I know, but. For those who watch a recording of this, it's free, but you must be a gold member of DaveLearner.com. That keeps a riffraff out. I know I'm kind of half kidding on that, but I've, as I've said a thousand times, I've been involved with a lot of groups over the years, some of them with professional traders. And and I swear to God, it, it, it often becomes Lord of the Flies really quickly. And I think we've been really blessed with this group. And I think having a little skin in a game, I think helps. And I think anyone here will attest that the group pays for itself, even though it's free, but you have to be a gold member again to qualify you. And the other thing with the gold member, you know, all kidding aside, is if there's any concept that you don't get, we have an avenue to to flesh that out. And you have all of the members courses and unlock the other courses that you're going to need to trade the methodology. And it's all 100% disclosed, no proprietary indicators. In fact, I even give you my indicators. So obviously you can interact with other traders, you can ask for help. We used to do Q&A sessions every two weeks, but once the Facebook group started, we just talk about everything there. The only thing is we're not capturing that content on the website, but there's a lot of information in the group. So I encourage you to do that. Sometimes see signs and signals, those everything I showed you here, except for the CRSR, which was a trading service, was first mentioned in Facebook by me and others. And then occasionally we'll throw out an ogre trade, TLRY. I think I ended up scratching on that. I, I could have made money, but I had a situation that happened yesterday that 
was uh, frustrating. Anybody make money on that ogre from yesterday? All right, let me shift gears, get the charts up. I'm gonna go real quick. I'm running late as usual, but let me just bang this out real quick. I wanna go through a few things in the market. It's not a tremendous amount to cover. And then uh, keep the stock picks coming. Stone IPA, is that, uh, how hoppy is that? I'm, I'm becoming a hop head, but I'm not a huge hop head. Oh, okay. That, that doesn't sound too bad. Okay, let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500, downside Landry lights, meaning that the highs are less than the moving average. In case you're watching a recording of this, I'm just repeating what I said a minute ago, which I'll edit out. And the highs are, the lows are now greater than moving average. That's upside Landry light. That'll make more sense if I show the ACP screen, which I will in a minute. And I said, if all you did was follow proper order, you'd have gotten long back here and stayed long for a long, long time. You would have gotten short in here, stayed short for a long, long time, okay? Now, ideally you want some kind of setup in addition to the proper order. Like right here, we had a bow tie, it's the downside market implodes. So you wanna make sure you're, you don't just flop back and forth when the proper order changes, but you'd be much better off at least doing that versus actually trading opposite of that, okay, or not paying attention to that at all. In fact, I don't know if we even got downtrend proper order in this little slide, but I know we were in downtrend proper order here, but notice that the market was already pushing back into that bow tie. So this was a sell signal right here, but it didn't trigger. So don't just blindly follow the moving averages or the Landry light or whatever. Do have some kind of setup in mind, but it does give you a framework to work with them. All right, let me bang out these other indices and some sector action real quick. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. So NASDAQ came, oh, back to the P's, just one second on the P's. So the P's, as you know, blasted all-time highs, came back in. We made it to all-time highs just yesterday. Nope, we didn't, not quite, sorry about that. Almost all-time highs. And then we sold off a little bit today, but off the worst level. So not the end of the world, but I'd like to see us get out of this wide and loose trading range, but certainly looking good in recent times. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now in that big old gap higher, the whole world was getting excited, but I was looking at the NASDAQ thinking, eh, this doesn't look too good. I shorted S&P futures. I think it should be three stabs to finally catch them. And I didn't make a whole lot, but I made a little bit by the end of the day. I'm like, you know, I'm in here shorting things and the whole media is celebrating like, this is happy days are here again. But you can see outside day down, okay? A little follow through the downside, tried to work its way higher, coming back in. The moving averages are in proper uptrend order, so we can watch for an uptrend, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't just jump in with both feet just yet. But you can see kind of wide and loose and sideways as of late. Russell 2000 has finally got into gear. Russell 2000 looks pretty good. It was all-time highs a couple days ago, and now we're pulling back a little bit, but it looks fantastic. Moving averages are now in proper order, 10 greater than 20, 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. One thing I've been watching quite a bit and talking about, like in trading service, is some of these areas that were trading sideways to lower now have this new life in them. The big question is, will it stick? Will these value areas like banking become the new momentum areas. Insurance broke out the brand new highs, pulling back a little bit, which so far it's so good. Some of these older momentum areas like drugs and biotechs are kind of wide and loose and sideways at best. Can they make it back to new highs? I don't know, but it'd be great if we had old momentum coming back to life and those value areas coming back to life. And his name is, when I try to say it on the fly, it always escapes me. The guy from Dorsey Wright from NASDAQ, he was also at one of the conferences back in September in San Fran. I can see his face. It'll come to me as soon as I'm done recording. <laughs> I'll put it up in the edited version of this. But anyway, he gave a great speech about how sometimes value becomes momentum, okay? Health services recently broken out of kind of a wide and loose consolidation, or you will call it. So they're kind of looking a little bit better than the drugs and the biotech. Retail's kind of becoming sideways in here. So that's a little bit concerning. 
transports recently broke out. So it's like some of these stodgy areas are beginning to perform well. Some of these previous momentum areas are kind of wide and loose and sideways. Semis, one exception there, so far broken out, kind of pulled back a little bit. So far, it looks pretty good in here for the semis. All right, let's bang out some of these individual issues. And if we have time, Max, I think I like that one. Yeah, it needs a little bit more knockout. I don't like the way it's just kind of drifting in here. Sometimes you get a knockout move and they just kind of drift higher. And that's when you kind of get in trouble. They kind of stall out and roll back over. I'd actually like to see it maybe drop a little bit closer to 35. Then I think I would take this one. The only problem is the volume is a little bit light on that one. Max is almost a carbon copy of ALGM. A ALGM. Well, the difference with ALGM is ALGM didn't do the drifting higher just yet. It kind of faked out a little bit, came back in. But I hear you, okay? I hear what you're saying. And my only concern with ALGM is it can be a little thin. The spread can get a little bad here and there. But I think it's worth it, worth a, a shot. TMO, is that a stock or is that an abbreviation for something? Yeah, this one caught my eye earlier tonight. And for some reason I passed, and I guess it's kind of that, that th same thing I just said. It, it, it kind of pulled back. I'd almost like to see it pull back a little more deeply in this case because it had, it had a pretty good run in here. And then it kind of crawled higher a little bit. I mean, you could certainly do much worse. But that's that would be a little bit of concern. And Zach's saying price for perfection. Good job, Zach. I'm proud of you. Paying attention. Yeah, that's one concern I have is when a stock's at really high levels. It's also has an HV of only 25. If you're gonna beat the market, you need stocks that have HV as a general statement much higher than the overall market. And like Zach said, price for perfection. When you see these stocks that are running these long, long, long-term uptrends, you have to wonder if they're priced for perfection, meaning that if they come out with one little hiccup or one little piece of bad news, earnings or something, they could go tumbling down. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but ideally you want to try to get in these things earlier in the in the trend cycle. Yeah, I bought this stinker on Monday with stop at 825. Anyone else? Well, it looks okay now that it's pulled back a little bit, but obviously you have to stop yourself out at some point. I think 825 would be a good spot to to think about exiting on that one. I don't remember why I didn't go after this one. I don't know if it was volume. I don't know what it was, but I did see it. And for some reason, I passed on that one. I passed it at Leslie too. I just couldn't get excited about pool supplies. And I regretted it for a minute, but then luckily it, uh, well, not luckily, but Fortunately, it didn't take off without me. But for those of you who took it, I don't want to pour salt in the wound. Sorry about that. And, you know, I've gotten burned on that, too, by not taking those uh, trades. AMWL, too, yeah, yeah, yeah. AMWL, too deep to pull back. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the first deep retrace, this is kind of an extreme first deep retracement. So, yeah, first deep retracement is when a stock takes off and then has a deep retracement, these IPOs, okay? But this is a little bit too extreme in this particular case longer term though this might be worth watching could go down and bottom out could make a bow tie or something you know might be worthwhile cprt that's one i was watching for a while it got past its prior little high and then it came all the way back in so i'm going to pass on that one and I, you, as you know, I think it was on the Landry list back here and it looked okay. I just couldn't get excited about an auto dealership, okay? And the HV is a little bit on the low side too. That probably turned me off a little bit. It's only 24, okay? Right now I'm finding most of my opportunities a little bit higher levels and the shorts, like um, what's the other home builder? Well, they're, the HV is pretty high on these guys too. Like I'm bearish on the home builders and whatever else is in the Landry list tonight. IDXX. Yeah, that looks okay. It's sort of the same pattern that we talked about earlier. It, it kind of knocked out, then kind of crawled higher. So 
it's okay and maybe it's priced for perfection too it's very extended longer term there might be something better out there but you know maybe it's counting on um corona to be around for a while whatever all right david's got to go pick up a kid at soccer <laughs> hope you didn't have too many ipas oh i'm confusing um two different people okay not everybody in here is drinking no i'm not drinking tree for stewart um too thin it's too thin to short way too thin to short it's kind of surprising because i've heard the name uh just too thin to short a little wide and loose you know take a look at the home builders something at a little bit higher level with a little bit more volume on the short side but yeah i, I hear you it's probably in trouble i sounds like a pirate stock huh yeah this might be worth watching it's not set up yet, but it did accelerate higher a little bit. Put that on, on your momentum list, okay? O-I-I-M, O-I-I-M. Yeah, that looks okay. It's like we've got this reoccurring pattern where the stocks kind of crawl up a little bit. You know, if it sold off a little bit, maybe above the pivot point here would be a way to go after that one, okay? That's, that's a pretty good looking stock. Put that on a minimum list for sure. NLS, NLS. Yeah, this looks like a, a short, okay? And I know it's been in my list lately. I don't know if it made it to the Landry list tonight. But here's a stock, you know, Zach mentioned price for perfection. Maybe this stock is in the early stages of cracking, okay? Uh, the moving averages haven't crossed over yet, but they will soon. Uh, what's that pattern? Explosion gap pivot when you have a gap and then it kind of goes into the gap a little bit. So yeah, this stock looks like it's in trouble. I think you could short it. I had an option in that, but thank but thank God I got out before gap down. Oh, okay, good job. Yeah, that option trading is tough as you're going to learn because option trading you only have to get price right or direction, and then you also have to get velocity and volatility and time you pretty much have to be a soothsayer you need crystal ball for options i do trade them on occasion yeah this looks really good i like this one who brought this up high five Stuart. high five first high five of the night kind of blast it higher i'd like to see a little bit more pullback a little bit more knockout move but yeah that's a good looking stock okay and it looks like it's fair, even though it's up 100%, it looks like it's fairly early in a cycle. So yeah, high five on that one. It's a good looking hospital. Zach says he started to get sick of him. Yeah, it's it's tough, it, you know, it, yeah, I, I know. They're tough. TT looks good, longer term uptrend needs a little bit more pullback, but yeah, absolutely, John, put that on your watch list. Or LTR, or LTR. Or LTR or TLR. Can you um is that the one you want? Rattler? Can you type in uh in, in caps so I could see it? Because my eye it's hard to read those. I don't know how to make it the font bigger. BKE looks good, okay. I, I was looking at this one earlier. This is in what I should do is flag. Let's do this for S and G's. If I take everything unflag everything if i go to my momentum list okay and if i flag everything here okay so I'll take a look at bke there it is right there okay you see it's got the little tick by it okay so yeah a little bit more pullback you're onto something there it is rtlr okay yeah i don't see that as momentum just yet you've got a bunch of overhead supply that's the problem in the oil field they're kind of all over the place right now i'm not really getting excited yet although the overall sector is looking okay i might have to nibble at the sector at some point in time c r s p uh this is too wide and loose gary okay and then the net net thing we talked about earlier okay where was it back in august where is it now percent different okay so yeah it's lost it looks like a big top unless it went on to make new highs okay 
So let's go back to all stocks and then we'll be able to see them more clearly. CPRT, no, we did that one in LS. Now I have the, somebody said in LS, we talked about that one. Yeah, I have that one as a possible short in my momentum list and you can see it's flagged on there. Okay. And then we talked about that one. Okay, I think we're nearly done. NTDOY, I don't know if I can pull that one up with this NTDOY. No, I can't pull it up here. Let me just pull up something real quick to show you. Let me pull up this ACP platform. The the Landry light that I was talking about. Damn it. <laughs> Where's my indicators? Let's see. It works a good rehearsal. Oh, I'm not logged in. Everything got knocked out today. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to show you this, but you, you guys have seen Landry Light before. The indicator would be down here. It's green when the lows are above and red when it's below. Go in and watch, I'll put some, uh, maybe some links at the end of this to some of the videos on YouTube, but just go to my YouTube channel, YouTube slash C slash Dave Landry. If you don't mind, if you've got anything out of this video, please like it, I appreciate it share it and also subscribe to my youtube channel to everybody here that's live thanks so much for coming i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here and i guess i'll see most of all you guys and girls tomorrow and facebook so see you there everybody have a great weekend if we don't we don't see you between now and then thank you so much